Hello everyone and welcome back to my Backgammon channel. Today it's with great pleasure that I introduce Mislav Kovacic, a Croatian Grandmaster who has an astonishing winning record, a particularly speed gammon. He won the speed tournament in the recent Swedish Open. He won the one in France, in Bewley, and just have a look online at all the things he's won. It's very impressive. Hi, Mislav, welcome to the channel. Hi, Daniel, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for your uh, nice words. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, it's, a, it's great to have you on. Like I would say at the moment, there's no one better in the world than you at Speed Gammon. Um, it's just amazing how well you play, and I'm really interested in kind of racking your brain to find out kind yeah, of, of yeah. uh, about right. that. Yeah. Um, so, firstly, what what drew you to backgammon? How long have you been playing? Um, tell us a bit about. Well, that. I generally like to play games, board games, card games. You know, whenever there is some game, I mean, I I just like to learn the rules and uh, you know compete with others. I just enjoy it and. Uh, but back then, I just randomly learned the rules of the game one day. I mean, I saw these uh, crazy, crazy triangles under, you know, on the back side of the chess set, and I never knew how to play it. You know, I just, you know, so I was like, okay, I need to learn this, and uh, I learned the rules, but I really didn't, uh, you know, give it that much attention. It was just yet another game that I play, and. Uh, one day, oh, I saw there are some books there. I mean, I Googled a little bit, saw some articles, saw some books. And uh, yeah, I decided to buy one. I, I think it was uh, actually two books. It was um, 501 uh, Begaman Problems by Roberti and Trice's uh, Bootcamp. So sure. yeah. Uh, and uh, that really opened my eyes, these two books, especially Roberti's book. I think that one really mm -hmm. kind of improved my game a lot in the initial stages when I was like a complete beginner, of course. And, uh, you know, it made me really fall in love with the game, I guess. I mean, uh, I, realize, I realize it's much deeper than I could ever imagine. And, you know, just slowly I started uh, learning more and more. And, uh, you know, we didn't even have tournaments or nobody really played in Croatia. I just, you know, I was like, you know, I was not the only one, but nothing was organized at the time. So when the first tournament was announced, like, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, whatever, uh, then my motivation started to, you know, grow in more. I wanted to, you know, participate and see if, you know, I can do something. So yeah, I mean that's how it started. You know, just randomly learning the rules and gradually, <laughs> and uh, gradually, yeah, improving from there. Yeah, all by myself basically. I didn't have any real life teachers, mentors, or whatever. Just the articles, books, and uh, you know, myself. Do you do you remember your first tournament, Miss Lav? Yeah, I kind of blurry actually, but yeah, I do remember. Yeah, I. I I was very, very nervous. Yeah, I know I was very nervous. I had a feeling that everyone was better than me, which yeah, was not entirely correct, but to some extent. And, you know, I was just, uh, actually it took me, I don't know, quite a few tournaments to really get, uh, you know, accustomed to playing. And, you know, I was counting like this and, you know, <laughs> and people were like, oh, look at this, you know, you were kind of almost making fun. And I was not even that bad. I mean, I was like maybe intermediate, not like a total beginner. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was funny, but yeah. <laughs> so now um, you go to many tournaments and you'll be going to Monte Carlo uh, very shortly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you preparing for Monte Carlo? Do you do preparation before big tournaments? Uh, nothing special. I mean, uh, for the most part, it's just what I normally do. I just play. I don't play too much uh, because I like to spend my time analyzing my matches very deeply, uh, move by move. So I guess I play a few matches per day. Uh, concretely for Monte Carlo, I played some longer matches. So I played some uh, 13 pointers, some 17 pointers against extreme gammon, against people. So that's maybe just you know, the difference compared to other tournaments. But basically I just play a few matches per day and then I analyze them. You know, I try to analyze my mistakes, but I also go through every move. I think that's important, not just going through the 
mistakes, but you know, going really move by move and you know, trying to you know, fix what can be fixed and yeah. Yeah, so you're not the first person that said that to go through every single move um, on the analysis. What, mm -hmm. why, why do you think that's so important to improve? Well, I mean, in every match, okay, there are many decisions which are, I guess, easy, but there are also quite a few decisions where you really don't know what to do. Like you have a dilemma, you, I mean, you have two reasonable alternatives and you really don't know what to play. And, uh, you know, you could just randomly get it right, you know, and if you never look at that decision again, then you don't learn anything. If you get that same similar decision in the future match, you will be equally clueless, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's important to go through every move, especially the moves where you had a dilemma. Maybe you got it right, maybe you didn't get it right, but just to, you know, the, I mean, it's not good that you had a dilemma because you clearly you didn't fully understand the position. Yeah, so, you know, these, those kind of decisions you have to pay attention to, I guess, and spend more time trying to, you know, understand why certain move is better than the others. So, yeah. Absolutely. I suppose you could say that a lot of analysis can be superficial. Yeah, I think that's the major problem of why people don't improve that much. I mean, we all enjoy playing, of course, that's the most fun part. And... Uh, we also hate looking at our mistakes. It's you know really bad for our ego. It's like <laughs> ah oh my god, and we just kind of skim through the match, and then just you know play another one, another one, another one. So one thing that I do to you know to prevent that from happening when I play a match, I don't start a new match until I analyze this one. So no way. I, I I don't care if I'm really eager to play. I just need to analyze this one. Uh, move by move, especially pay attention to the mistakes, of course, and only then will I play another match. So that's kind of my way to, because if I start playing match after match after match, and after five, six matches, you know, nobody's motivated to analyze that man, you know, them all deeply, right? So I think <laughs> I get more benefit from playing um, maybe two, three matches and just analyzing them deeply rather than, you know, playing 10 and, you know, just quickly going through the mistakes. I'm, I don't think there's much uh, value to it, so yeah. Sure. So let's talk about your recent tournaments, uh, the Swedish Open where you won the Speed and yeah. the one in France, uh, the Bewley, where you won the Super Speed. Super speed can, yeah. you, can you differentiate between normal, speed, super speed, high? Like what do all these variants of backgammon mean? Can you explain to the viewer? Yeah, sure. Uh, so speed gammon, many people, will probably know, but it is the basically format where you have 10 seconds per move. So 10 seconds is free each move. And uh, you also have two minutes time bank, which means after if you spend more than 10 seconds per move, then your time bank, bank will start sticking. So, and normally it's a five point match, the speed gamma, but it, it can be played also in, in longer formats. Uh, uh, and uh, regarding the super speed, it's, yeah, as the name says, it's uh, way faster. So it's uh, seven seconds per move, which is really, really crazy. And uh, 30 seconds, just 30, half a minute time bank. So that's uh, you know, really stressful. <laughs> so but for the whole match, for the whole five point match. You for the whole five point match, yeah, you have uh, ten sec uh, seven seconds per move in super speed and 30 seconds time bank. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> it sounds uh exhausting how what is the appeal why do people kind of play these super fast matches do you think why do you play them well i mean they're fun for sure i mean uh i think they're just fun uh, as, as stressful as they can be you know it's just you know for me it's exciting maybe a little bit even more exciting than the than the normal matches but uh, you know each has their own uh, kind of uh, feeling and advantages so so let's talk more about speed gamma and that's really why i wanted to get you on the channel um, to talk about what what makes you so good at it so mm -hmm. like what are the ingredients um to being good at speed gamma can you give some some advice um, yeah, yeah, yeah well i guess first of all uh, uh i should say be calm so whenever i i mean very often when i start a speed gamma match or after a game or two, you know, I see my some of my opponents, you know, nervous, uh, stressed, uh, 
they are looking at their clock, you know, they're in panic mode, basically. But I mean, first advice would be just keep calm. I mean, the conditions are same for everyone, you know, the same stress and, uh, you know, with the pressure that you're feeling, I'm feeling too, you know, I'm not, not easy to play when you have like, you know, few seconds to make your decisions. So yeah, that, that would be like the first advice. Then the second advice, I guess, would be to make sure you are concentrated, focused, because I think backgammon tournaments are really noisy environment. So, and in a normal, in a normal match, I mean, that's not such a big deal. You have a lot of time on your clock, even if your mind goes blank, nothing's going to happen. You still have time to recover, right? I mean, uh, you can burn some time and nothing will happen, right? You will still have probably enough time, but in speed gammon, if you get distracted even for like, you know, 30 seconds, it's, you know, it's not good. It's horrible. <laughs> so the way I deal with it is very simple. I always have my earplugs. So I try to minimize the outside the noise as much as I can, because, you know, I have yet to go to a backgammon tournament, which is uh, not noisy and, uh, you know, <laughs> So, I mean, that seems like a small thing, but to me, it really helps me to concentrate when I can kind of uh, quiet the, the background. That, that really helps me a lot uh, with the concentration. Uh, then uh, another thing I could say is, uh, which may sound funny, but you have to roll efficiently, roll the dice efficiently, basically, because you have 10 seconds per move and uh, you spend, I guess, about two seconds to shake the dice and to roll. And according to the rules, you have to shake at least three times. You have to roll. Some rules say it says like that, and then you have to roll. So, you know, if let's assume that I spend two seconds for shaking and rolling, and let's say you spend three seconds, right? Doesn't seem like a big deal and probably wouldn't be in a normal match. But in speed game, if the match is like 100 moves, it means I've gained 100 seconds, right? I have 100 more seconds to think. And that's huge. That's one minute and 40 seconds, which is, you know, in speed gammon where you have only two minutes, that's a huge gain. So really roll efficiently, don't shake forever. If you can't do that, use the baffle box. So yeah, that, that may seem like a kind of funny advice, but it, I think it's important as well. So, you know, then uh, I guess what else I could say? I, well, something that I do, which I guess gives me a bit of an edge compared to most other players is that I'm able to do the running pip count difference. Uh, so what it means is for those who don't know, like let's say I open the game with 6-3. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm up nine pips. So the opponent rolls 3-2, okay, now I'm up four pips. And I keep on doing that for the entire match basically. And I know it sounds tough and it's really, you know, but it's basically a lot of practice. It took me, you know, took me a lot of time to really be able to do that effortlessly. And uh, I mean, I don't think you have to do that to be good at speed. I, like most grandmasters don't do that, uh, but you do have to be, have a good kind of sense for the race mm -hmm. or you have to be able to, I guess, estimate or count quickly. And even if you don't keep the running pip count for the entire game, you should be able to keep it at least for some parts. Like let's say, you're close to a cube, you know you're up, I don't know, eight pips, you need some pips more. And then, and then for the next few rolls, keep the count, just don't lose it. Because if you don't do it, then you have to count every single time. So yeah, those are some, uh, some tips. So, so, you know, being able to do the running pip count difference, I think that gives me a bit of an edge. That's something that's like a big factor maybe. Because even when I have like, you know, a few seconds in my time bank, you know, I still know the pip count. I don't have to waste time on that. So that, that can help a lot. But uh, I should say I do lose it from time to time, you know, you know <laughs> need to be concentrated 100%, you know, for all the matches that you play. So it happens. And, yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. I saw you in a recent video with Mitchie um, and, uh -huh. and you were doing the running pip count there. And I, I think there were times when Mitchy was was asking you, what, what's a pip yeah. count? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mitchy was, uh, yeah, this was funny. Of course, it was a friendly exhibition match. So he asked me and I, of course, replied, which I probably wouldn't in a tournament match. But, you know, it was all fun. And, you know, he was uh, really kind of amazed that I could uh, 
play, speak, and keep the running pip count. So to be honest, I didn't expect I'd be able to do it either because I haven't really played and talked before. So that was the first time for me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, somehow I did. I was able to keep the... So when you first started practicing pip count, were there any methods you used? Did you? Yeah, uh, yeah. besides the running pip count, um, I my preferred method is to, of course, if the positions are relatively similar, I will do the mental shift. Mm -hmm. So I will try to, you know, I mean, people can Google that if they don't know the way. It's hard to describe it. Yeah, of course. Uh, you just try to make the positions even your and your opponent, and then you get a pip count difference that way. And then there are two good methods to get the pip count difference, which I think is really the most important thing, unless you are like in a race and you need to know the exact pip counts of both sides. So for the pip count difference, there is a colorless count and there is crisscross count. So my preferred one is crisscross count. Again, crisscross people can Google it. There, is, there are many links they're describing. So I'm using crisscross, I'm able to count the difference, basically who is up or who is down in like 15, 20 seconds maximum. Any position, doesn't matter how complex and the numbers, the calculations are really easy, nothing, uh, you know, brain burning. So <laughs> that's the method I would recommend uh, to people who yeah, don't already have their favorite <laughs> methods. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's some great methods there. And the yeah. colorless counting is, is an interesting Yeah, and one more thing, maybe even if you don't know the pip count, pip count at all times, you should kind of have a good feeling about the race. So playing some matches without pip count online as a practice is a good thing, at least. I know it's not fun, it's a bit, you know, <laughs> but at least from time to time, you know, you should maybe play a match or two without a pip count online or against Extreme Gammon or whatever you prefer. And that way you can kind of practice your, uh, yeah, yeah, the real life. Uh, <laughs> what what do you think it is that people find difficult about the pip count? Is it just kind of laziness people aren't willing to do it over the board? Uh, like what stops people from keeping a, a running pip count when they're playing? Well, it's, uh, to be honest, uh, it's not easy. I mean, uh, it's definitely distracting. I mean. Uh, for sure, when uh, when I'm playing online and I see the pip count, it's much easier. <laughs> but you know, it definitely requires huge concentration, huge concentration. If I'm distracted by something, I will not be able to play and keep the count at the same time. So that's, uh, I mean, it's it's not the method I would necessarily recommend to people. They can try it, and I I should. Uh, I, I should say they should try it uh, at least for uh, like some weeks, maybe even some months, try to improve and see if they can get it to such a level that they do it effortlessly. But even if they can't do the running pip count, I mean, I don't think most grandmasters do it. So they are still doing well and you know, they're you know, playing well. So just at least be have a good feeling for the race, have a good method to get a difference crisscross or whatever you use and uh, you should be good but again if you can get the running pip count to work for you that's great you know just be you know uh, what can i say be uh, patient be patient um, practice it and uh, over time you will see improvement for sure so it took, me, took me quite a few months to really get it to work in the real <laughs> life mostly. it's not like i you know yeah <laughs> and i should say i don't think i have like uh any extraordinary short-term or long-term memory, you know, so for me, you know, I think there are people with much better memory than me. So in that sense, I don't think that's a prerequisite for doing a running pip count, you know, I think. Yeah. When you, um, when you play speed matches, how do you allocate the little time you have between the easy decisions and the difficult decisions? How, how do you know how to use the time efficiently? Well, to be honest, I'm not even sure if I always use it efficiently. That's the, that's really difficult. But uh, well, in uh, speed game and generally, obviously, you can't really afford to spend too much time on uh, on details. That's yeah. Like if I know that I have two candidates and I'm so unsure, then you know maybe I should just play the move. And if I know that even one minute of thinking or two will not help me, then I should really kind of tell to myself, okay, you're not going to figure this out, just play something, you know, you have to kind of do that kind of thinking. 
but you know, of course, when you have, uh, I guess, a big cube, or when you are offered a tough cube in a gammonish position, you should spend some time, even if it's a speed gammon. If you have to spend a minute, spend a minute. If it's a high cube, you know, it's very important for your you know, match winning chances. That's an important decision. So even if you spend most of your time, it may be worth it. Uh, but yeah, just try not to spend too much time on some random aces or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things that you are not going to figure out that quickly anyway. So, And, and on those big cube decisions in a speed match, um, how much do you apply match equity, take points, or do you do it more on reference positions, instinct? Yeah, I mostly do it based on the feeling. I mean, I think uh, I have a very, I'm, of course, I know some take, all main take points, for especially for short matches. But, you know, like, I don't know, four-way, two-way, I just kind of feel when I should drop it, when I should take it. So, you know, I would say for me, it's 70% feeling at least mm -hmm. at these typical scores. Maybe when I'm unsure, I may try to kind of uh, estimate numbers. But yeah, I think you should just develop a feeling for the most part, yeah. Sure. And um, how do you do that, develop a feeling? <laughs> how... Yeah. Well, uh, playing a lot of short matches, uh, you know, seven point matches are really useful. You get to see all these uh, important scores that you face every time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just uh, if you see that some specific score is troubling you, just, you know, open the folder, save the positions uh, with that score, or even uh, play against the computer from that score, like four way, two way, just play 20 games against. I actually mm. used to do that a long, long time ago. Mm. I don't know what scores, but some scores that bother me that I was not feeling confident about, I would just set a score and play against the computer as many times and try to get as many decisions as I can. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's good advice. On XG, you can uh, play from position, can't you? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's easier than doing it against human, of course. So, yeah. <laughs> For specific sports, then, yeah. You might have read the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow um, by Daniel Kahneman. It's um, mm. famous work on social psychology um, and cognitive bias. But I think it really applies um, to backgammon. Sometimes we think slow and sometimes we think fast and being able to differentiate between that can ultimately make us better players. Do you want to say something uh, about how you do that over the board? Yeah, I mean, that's the toughest part for, I mean, uh, there are still quite a few matches where I'm not happy with my time management, where I still kind of, I'm a perfectionist. So I try to, you know, get the moves right. So, you know, I can't even say it's my like, Okay, I guess I do it well, but not. It's far from perfect, you know. Mm -hmm. I still have decisions where I spend more time than I should. Yeah, that, that's my main, I guess, weakness. You know, <laughs> I don't rush my decision. That's for sure. I will, uh, you know. I, um, but usually, I may occasionally spend uh, some time on some details where I shouldn't have. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess over the board, you just have to not just think about what you're going to play, but think about how important this is uh, for your like match winning, like a random maze, probably not too important. Uh, and also think about whether you're likely to get it, you know, to figure it out. If you're not likely to figure it out, you know, just, I mean, why spend 20 seconds? You can just play it you know, within 10 seconds. So yeah, think about what you do, but also think about, you know, whether it's worth spending time in the back of your mind, you have to keep asking that in speed, yeah, where it matters. You ask, keep asking yourself when you get stuck and you're not sure about a certain position, just, you know, ask yourself, will I figure it out? Does it make sense to spend like 30, 40 seconds on it? Or, you know, I should just play something, yeah. Mm, that's interesting. And do you think there are things you can get faster at, um, certain aspects of the, of the game? Uh, well, for sure you can, yeah. I mean, uh, um, as you improve uh, in certain position types, uh, like containment, if you if you practice, usually people are slow when they, when they are in some crazy, you know, uh, <laughs> container when they hit a checker and they hold those uh, checkers in the outfield. So, but if you, you know, if you study it a lot, if you 
then you will you should you should for sure your speeds will improve over time in any in any game category yeah the more you study it the the better it will be that's for sure yeah yeah i i guess someone could maybe study something like opening replies Mm -hmm. um so you're basically taking no time on opening yeah replies. yeah that's that's uh, yeah of course that's important as well yeah yeah first two moves we we should be able to know to know yeah uh, do you still do you still read and study the game or not so much yeah no? yeah i still do uh so i mean there are actually quite a few books coming out uh lately so yeah i read mitch's books and uh <laughs> I bought Roberti's books, the new ones, uh, serious on the opening phase, but I still haven't read them. Read <laughs> on the them. shelf. Yeah. Half of the first book, yeah, I didn't, but they're all great books. So, I mean, yeah, of course, when you reach a certain level, um, I guess you don't pick up a lot from them, but you still pick up something. Like uh, Mitch's book is a good example. I mean, it's really best suited, I guess, for intermediates, maybe even beginners, but you know, I still occasionally few sentences click well with me and I'm like, oh, wow, that's such a good way to put it. You know, mm. that's a, it's a detail, but I feel like it improves my game at least a little bit, you know, so I would recommend reading to anyone. Uh, it doesn't matter what level of player they are. So yeah, I think that that helps for sure. It's all about those small gains. Like yeah, 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 yeah. The better you are, of course, then it, it can't be nothing else but the small games, right? Mm. The really kind of details. Yeah. Is is there something you can remember learning recently that you can share with the audience? Um, something. Hmm. Something that I learned recently. Uh, okay, so yeah, I guess uh, Michi had a very nice discussion when to leave the twenty-two point anchor. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls it butterfly anchor because we are happy to make it in the early stage of the game but uh, we are also very happy to kind of leave it at some point i mean faster than like 20 or 21 point anchor so michi gave some a few good uh, kind of uh, criteria under which we leave the 22 point anchor so basically he said uh, like uh, if you can't really improve, if you can't really improve your like forward position that much in terms of priming or blitzing, and you get a rule which lets you escape your uh, twenty-two point anchor, then you should strongly consider it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are leaving zero or one spare checkers in the outfield in both outfields after the move, then you should strongly consider breaking the twenty point twenty-two point anchor. So that was a really kind of cool tip, and I really so that in many positions, if I'm left with zero or one spares in both outfield, then it really does become correct very often to leave the 22 point anchor. So that was one good tip that I read. But of course he gives you know, many examples in his book. So like, yeah, you should, I, people should read it. That, that yeah, sure. absolutely. That's in a back checker strategy in his- Yeah, back uh, checker strategy. Yes, in yes. his recent book. Um, but his other two books as well, both both essential, really. I, I yeah, think, yeah, I think yeah. To read. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about writing one yourself? Yeah, I have actually, but uh, you know, I know it would take me forever because <laughs> I would go through, you know, every sentence over and over again until I'm. I didn't like, you know, I, I'm just perfectionist, so it would take forever. But I guess eventually, you know, I, I may go for it. You know, maybe when I, you know, cut down on my tournaments a little bit. Uh, when I, you know, start playing a little bit less, when I maybe focus on teaching a bit more, then maybe I don't consider doing it. But, you know, I'm not able to write the book quickly. I just cannot. I mean, I'm uh, so, I mean, I have some interesting, I think, things I could say and the topics I could cover, but, you know, I'm, the, you know, the collecting the positions, mm. it's like, uh, you know, the process which, you know, never stops, you know, you always <laughs> find a better example. And I'm sure if after I would write a chapter, like a week after, I'm sure I would find a better example than I would have to rewrite it. I'm that kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That kind of I, yeah. I feel that I put a lesson out on my yeah. channel on duplication and I find a better <laughs> example of duplication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. So why is it um, players play worse at speed than normal play? 
Like, mm-hmm. what, is it just the time constraints, or is is it more kind of going on? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, mostly for sure is the time, but also it's uh, the stress and not handling the stress. You know, panicking when they see they are low on time. So, like, very typical thing I see, like when they are when they when the opponent has. Uh, when they have uh, like a very little time in time bank. So, I mean, you still have 10 free seconds every move, but they start playing super fast. They start playing within three seconds. You don't have to do that. Even mm-hmm. if you have four seconds in your time bank, use all your 10 seconds per move that you get for free. You know, don't panic, don't play your move in three seconds. Nobody can play well in three seconds. You just use most of your 10 seconds, you know, keep calm, don't, uh, don't stress. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, lack of time is for sure the major factor that we all play in a little bit worse or, or lot worse in speed, but also try to, you know, not let uh, the emotions get to you, <laughs> but, uh, I guess, yeah. You see uh, Japanese players or someone like Thomas Tenland, and they are just have this kind of calmness and serenity about them when they play over the board yeah 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 danish players japanese players yeah some norwegian players yeah definitely yeah and uh, you know when i see that my opponent is stressed uh, nervous uh, it's not good for him for two reasons first of all it affects his play for sure uh, if, uh, and secondly it gives me confidence when i see him uh, in a panic mode i'm i mean it, it's a great confidence boost <laughs> But when I'm playing against someone who is like a stone, you know, it's you know, it's much more difficult psychologically. Yeah. They feel like you, you feel like you know they're in control. They they know everything. Maybe, but you know, maybe it's just a, it's all just an act. You know, maybe they just you know. <laughs> I'm sure inside they are ex- as excited as as anyone, but they on the outside they you know try not to reveal anything. So <laughs> yeah. You should try to do that if you can, and not don't let the you know. So you men, you mentioned earlier that you listen. You have headphones when you when you play. Yeah, I have earplugs. I don't really like, but yeah, some people can use headphones if they like or if they want to listen to music. For me, it's a distraction, so I really prefer just the you know earplugs to minimize the the the, the sound. But and but yeah, if someone prefers headphones, why not? Yeah. And how, and how so else? Even, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, there are even noise reduction headphones, which like you like, you can't even listen to music on them. They just kind of even you know, yeah, I don't need that. For me, the normal earplugs are just good enough to to yeah. And and how else do you stay calm um, when you play? Do you have any kind of pre-match rituals stuff you do to stay in kind of calm and in the zone? But to be honest. I can't really think of anything, you know, I mean, uh, I always remind myself that even if I feel some kind of uh, pressure, stress and everything, I always tell myself, well, the opponent feels it, as, feels it as well, maybe even more, maybe a lot more than you. So it's normal. It's, uh, you know, especially if it's like a high stakes tournament match, it's normal to feel some you know, excitement or some, uh, you know, pressure but you know just kind of accept it as normal and you know calm down breathe in breathe out you know. <laughs> don't panic uh, yeah everything will be all right and how do you deal with um jokers those those amazing roles that that turn like a losing situation into a winning one yeah i think it doesn't affect me much i at least i train myself i mean we all react to it on the inside at least but i mean I guess over the years I've trained myself not to be bothered by it that much. So, you know, <laughs> I don't think I'm like stone cold, like a Japanese and stuff. I do show emotion from time to time, but uh, for the most part, jokers, anti-jokers, that doesn't bother me or affect me that much. Yeah. 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 What, um, so what advice would you have um, for a player um, just starting kind of speed gammon? Um, you know what tips are there to kind of get better at speed do you think well again uh, practice for sure is the key right just play a lot of speed matches you can even play speed game and online mm-hmm. i think uh on, concretely on heroes you will have six seconds i think per move which i think is actually pretty good because you don't waste time rolling uh online 
So six seconds is a good approximation maybe of the of the live real life play. So that's the time setting that I like. So you know, just practice, get used to the to you know playing speed. That's that's the main thing, I guess. You know, just a lot of uh, practice matches and uh, yeah, I mean. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Besides the other things that I said, you know, roll efficiently, you know, try sure. to keep calm. Uh, okay. What are the <laughs> distractions? Yeah. No. So, yeah. What, what would you say are some common mistakes that, that players make? Maybe like intermediate, advanced level players. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of flag some of the kind of common areas where they kind of fall down on? Um, what? I, they can be, it can be quite a few things i guess i mean it's very individual i would say it's hard for me to mm -hmm. to come up with something like general but uh, yeah but i think generally people are generally too stressed too nervous more <laughs> nervous than they should be when playing speed so just cal kind of calming down should uh, should help uh, should help a lot yeah and, uh, i feel like um, I don't know, when I'm low on time myself, sometimes I see that they will be like, oh, they have a tough cube decision. And, uh, you know, they just drop the cube because, uh, you know, I'm low on time, let's play some more games. So, yeah, I think you should just not do these kind of adjustments. Uh, I think you should just uh, not be bothered too much by the opponent's time, just focus on your decisions. And another, uh, okay, another mistake that I, uh, noticed when I'm low on time, like when I have a very little time in my time bank, some of my opponents are playing really, really fast. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, in chess, maybe that would make sense because in chess, you can do some planning, right? Nothing good, drastic is happening, but in Begum, you can't really plan that much. You know, one rule can completely change the character of the game. So if your opponent is low on time, don't play fast, you know, just, Play even slower, you know. You know, make put pressure on him by playing good moves. You know, don't don't rush. There is no need to rush. Yeah. That's do you thing. do you adjust to players if you're playing someone you know is a weaker player? Uh, do you mm -hmm. kind of drop, you know, more kind of racing cubes and things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for the most part, I just want to play correct backgammon for the most part, but. Definitely, there are situations both with the checker and the cube where I will adjust. So let's start. We can start with the cube. Like, for example, gamanish positions against the weaker player. I guess people say you should drop a little bit more, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You don't want to lose a gammon, especially in the speed gammon. You don't want to lose four points and you're kind of dead. <laughs> But it also depends on uh, on the position. Like if position is complex, if I expect that there will be some tough checker decisions, then I will take maybe even deeper. I don't mind taking deep. Uh, so, but if position is like gammonish and like super easy to play, you know, they just you know if they roll well, they just kind of destroy you. Then that's another thing. Then I may drop a little bit faster. So that's one thing I guess. Uh, but also with the yeah, borderline race decisions, high cubes, you pass a little bit you mm -hmm. know, sooner, a little bit faster against the weaker opponent. But also with the checker play, I do make some adjustments, which I think maybe, I'm, I'm not sure if other grandmasters, I'm sure they do to some extent, but uh, I mean, as I said, I try to make the best move, right, mm -hmm. for the most part. But if I encounter a decision where I have two reasonable looking candidates and I'm like, I really don't know what's correct. And you, you, I mean, you have, that happens a lot in every match, right? You have at least few such decisions where you just don't know and both things make some sense. Well, instead of, instead of burning my time, I mean, then I ask myself, well, I'm not going to figure it out. So let me think which of these moves is going to present my opponent with tougher decisions in the future. So instead of burning time, trying to figure out something that I will not be able to figure out, I think about that. So, you know, simple as that example could be, you know, difference between split and slot, right? If yeah. you think both make sense in this particular position, maybe you will want to maybe slot an important point against a uh, weaker opponent. Like if he misses you, you quickly build up your, you know, offensive position, maybe you're closer to a cube. If he hits you, great, you get one checker sent back, then you enter a hit back, maybe you have more checkers sent back. 
And these kind of positions where one side, doesn't matter which side, has four, five, six checkers back, these positions are definitely the kind of positions where we can, weaker player will make more errors than normal. I mean, I sometimes say, you know, everyone knows how to play position. Okay, that's an exaggeration with zero, one or two checkers back. I mean, we just see them like most of the time, of course, we still make big mistakes even there, but but when one of the uh, you know players has like a four, five, six checkers back, it's not yet a bad game, it's like a proto bad game, which means it could still go either way. You, it could go forward, it could still, you know, you don't really commit to a bad game yet. You don't really go forward yet. It's a fine balance. You have to find the fine balance between going forward, keeping contact, and then at some point you maybe you have to, you decide to, uh, you have to play a bad game or and so on and so on. So these kind of positions on both sides are challenging. So if I can make a move, which increases the likelihood of getting such positions, then that's cool, right? Again, yeah. uh, as I said, so, if I think the move is clearly right, I will play it. I'm not going to do any crazy things, but if I really have no idea, I have two reasonable candidates, then I think about this, only them. So maybe a few times per match, maybe more. And then I think about, okay, which of these moves might present him with more difficult decisions in the future. So Interesting, good answer. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting, checker play adjustment to in some ways coerce your opponent into more difficult game plans yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That, are, that are harder to play. We all know that a back game it can be very, very difficult, even for a grandmaster yeah, yeah, to yeah. play. On yeah. both sides, for both sides, yes. Mm. In defending and playing, yeah. So Interesting. Can you think of um, a mistake that you used to make that you overcame, like maybe going back five, ten years, mm -hmm. something you used to do and that you, you noticed through your analysis and then you improved upon? Well, I think I used to drop too much. Uh, I, uh, it was maybe connected with my you know, wish to kind of adjust against weaker opponents. But then at some point I realized that I'm just dropping too much and, you know, the, <laughs> the easy solution was, you know, you just start taking more. Like <laughs> when you get the tough decision, you're not sure. Well, instead of dropping, how about you try to take this time? So, so this is only, you know, when I have really, really like a big dilemma between take and pass, then I may consider the opponent and so on. But yeah, I guess that was one of my weaknesses before. Yeah, I, I, I asked Mark the question just on the previous interview. Uh -huh. What, why do people find cube action so difficult compared to checker play? Like, wh what is it about the cube that is so kind of hard? <laughs> do you, I guess what's hard is, I mean, when you have a checker play, you just, you know, you roll something, you have to play. But the, let's say mixed cubes, mixed cubes are a big problem, but nobody tells you when you have a cube. So each roll, you have to keep it in the back of your mind. Do I have a cube? And then a sequence, and maybe it's a big no double, and suddenly a sequence happens where you suddenly have a huge double, and you just miss it because like move ago, you are still in like, oh, it's not even close to a cube, right? So yeah, these kind of swings, I guess, are tricky with the cube. Uh, you know, you have to, you know, nobody really tells you when you should consider the cube action, but you should actually consider it every roll. You know, it mm -hmm. could always be a cube. If you have a slight advantage, you should. Uh, so it's easy to miss cubes if you just, you know, ignore that fact that you might have the cube. So. so before you pick up the dice, you're always thinking about the cube action and the match score. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. I always keep it in the back of my mind. So, and uh, for that reason, that's also what I said previously. Even when I have a uh, very easy decision on like automatic or semi automatic decision, even then, I will still probably use most of my delay time, like 10 or 12 seconds, whatever. I, I, why would I play the move in three seconds? I can just, you know, I know what I'm going to do, but I use this time to kind of evaluate position. Am I close to cube? Is he close to cube? Will it be a take or pass or whatever is relevant? So, you know, don't just don't play too fast. Even if it's an easy move, you spend your 10 or if it's a speed gamut, spend your 10 seconds, make a move. And, you know, you have time to think about some general game plan ideas. Uh, yeah. I, I guess the issue is how do we define easy moves? Because 
I think a lot of mistakes are made from people thinking, oh, I never stiff the midpoint, always make the five point. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And, and these kind of rules that aren't, they're not concrete, are they? You know, they, they, they're in flux and they change depending on the dynamic of, of the position. Yeah, r- rules can be a very tricky thing. Um, I mean, I personally like having rules of thumb. I know there are some grandmasters which hate the rules of thumb, and I can totally understand it. But I think uh, when you know the rules of thumb, you should also definitely pay attention to the exceptions. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I mean, like always make the five point. I mean, there are so many exceptions. So, you know, uh, just save those exceptions. I mean, I used to have a folder with uh, making five points or not, and uh, so, sorry, yeah, like uh, uh, b- basically, you should also be aware of the exceptions. Uh, when you encounter an, an exception, just kind of keep track of it. I mean, uh, try to understand it. Uh, why? Why did it happen? So you know, but yeah, blindly following rules of thumb is uh, yeah not a good idea. I, I mean, I mean, I guess I I start with it. Okay, I, have, I know all these rules of thumb, but then of course you have to evaluate the position. You have to, you know, go through the rules, try to imagine how the game is going to look like after this move or that move. Of course, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I agree that uh, relying too much on rules of thumb is not not good. Yeah. I, I think an example of that that I can just think of is um, when your opponent has slotted the five point, and then you get a three one. Mm-hmm. And you have the option between making your five point or hitting, mm-hmm. and it, it's correct to, to hit with with a free one. In yeah, the... yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually we hit mostly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but again, you could be tricked into thinking of oh, a five point. I must. Yeah, make... I always make the yeah. That that that's the problem. So I guess you can keep the rules of thumb in the back of your mind, but it should not dictate your decision making. Like okay, yeah, you always make the five point, but let's see what happens here. Like. Uh, how does my position look like after this move? How does my position look like after that move? You kind of imagine the, the future after both moves. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. As long as you don't solely rely on the rules of thumb, just keep it in the back of your mind, that's good. But I think they are okay. But uh, if that's your old thinking process, always make the five point and you'll make so many blunders where it's not correct to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you, how, how do you feel about bluff cubing, uh, Ms. Lav? Um, yeah, that's actually something I do quite a bit, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean uh, yeah, that's also something that I, uh, that I uh, mentioned previously. So uh, let's say I roll a strong uh, attacking roll, strong attacking number. I know how to play it. I could play it in two seconds, but again, I spend my time my 10 seconds I spend my delay and I already ask myself oh what if the opponent dances will I have a cube right I I mean it's not always easy to think that far ahead but let's say I hit a checker and if I have enough time I may spend a few seconds more to ask myself whether I have a cube or not and then let's say I decide I have a cube and they dance and then boom I snap cube no you know no thinking because I thought about it previously you know I spent my five or six seconds previously I didn't just rush with my easy to play role. I spent my time and, you know, that's how you get people to drop some cubes. You know, they're like, you know, they think you're catching the cube. I mean, but who would be so crazy to cube right away? It's like, you know, you do that when you catch the game, right? You know, you cube uh, right away. So if I can make a decision about the cube uh, while I'm already considering checker play, that's good. I'm just kind of giving them a, the, you know, snap cube as soon as they dance in snap cube, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it's like, so it can be a big mistake actually to, you know, analyze the position for one or two minutes. And then, I mean, they should, even they, if they are clueless, they may, you know, get an idea why would you spend time? So it's probably an easy take, right? <laughs> if you are spending time on this. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the psychology. Yeah. It, yeah. That's interesting what you say. And I think that's important because a checker play and a cue play, are interrelated and you're making the checker plays with a foreknowledge of a cube decision that comes afterwards yeah again i'm not saying i can always know exactly what's going to happen but sometimes i try when i get a great like kind of like a joker or whatever i ask myself oh what if he enters on my ace point will i have a cue what if he dances 
it's not i'm not saying i will i can always come up with that decision you know so easily right sometimes i do need to spend my time after they have uh, rolled their made their move but uh, if i can make this decision and then just kind of shock them with a fast cube that, that's <laughs> great you know yeah and it also works the other way around so you can avoid your opponent giving you the cube by making a maybe a safer checker play or something Overlooking. yeah yeah and one, one other thing uh, maybe i should not be revealing this but uh, like if they give you a cube and uh, never snap drop okay if it's like a super easy cube which is like borderline too good yeah n you don't have to act just drop it but if it's like a tricky cube and you know it's a drop i mean even if you know 100 percent you're going to drop spend 10 seconds make them think that you you know you're a kind of player who is not pushed around who maybe will spend more than 10 seconds if you have time, you know, study the uh, study. But if you start, you know, dropping the cubes, like, you know, just like that, and they may get an idea and they may, you know, they may start cubing you, you know, more aggressively, which is not something you want when you're playing a weaker opponent and they cube you aggressively. That's, you know, that's unpleasant. They can easily win the match. But if mm -hmm. they are conservative with the cube, you know, that's the best playing style to play against. And that's you know they really need like a lot more luck to win if they are not going to cube with their but even if they give like a blunder cubes early cubes in a like a strong attacking position it can be unpleasant so by kind of uh spending time kind of not not step dropping the cubes maybe you make them think that uh you know you're not easy to push around you know? <laughs> <laughs> but just some uh, thoughts yeah yeah it's good good advice and do you, do you give lessons as well, Ms. Love? Yeah, from time to time. But to be honest, uh, I'm just so busy playing lately. And again, same thing with the, the other things in backgammon. I'm just perfectionist. Even when I do that, I cannot have more than a few students at the same time because I really want to focus on that. I like to study their matches. Um, it's not just me playing against them. I really want to see what they're doing wrong and that uh, takes a lot of effort i want to go through their matches i really want to try to categorize them with, i mean try to see what they are doing wrong so you know i mean it's definitely time consuming but if i'm going to do the lesson that's the only way i'm going to do the lesson so you know at the moment i'm not doing that much because uh I'm doing fairly well with tournaments i'm you know not not in a huge like need to do it but if I have, but I, you know, I mean, actually, I have to say, I haven't really played that much during uh, COVID, so that's why I'm playing tournament after tournament now. <laughs> so I'm like really, like you know, just busy playing all the time. So, but when I, you know, start playing a little bit less, maybe I will uh, add some more lessons to <laughs> to my. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, that's well, good. Yeah, I can put your details in the video description uh, if, sure, if, sure, if sure. people want to contact yeah, people can find me on Facebook or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, do you find when you play normal speed backgammon, it, it's too slow for you? Um, not really. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if you watch some of my like um, regular tournament matches i'm actually i can be quite slow actually you know <laughs> and that's actually funny because i uh, you know I, I could even be i mean i often finish my matches the last you know i even in the regular tournament matches i often spend most of my time bang you know i'm very slow i'm trying to use most of my time uh so i like to think i mean i'm good at speed i guess but you know when i have time i like to use it so so it's not really, I wouldn't say speed is too slow for me. Yeah. I mean, I like to think, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, we've spoken a lot about your success and also online as well. Um, you do a lot of WBIF online tournaments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you were you were rated number one, uh, weren't you? On it. Is that correct? No, um, I'm not sure at the moment. I'm not number one in the terms of the, in terms of the L, ra L ranking, but somewhere near the top, but I guess in terms of uh, the tournament results, I think I have close to 40 caches, so that's like crazy. I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure it's 40, maybe 35, 30, yeah, but well over 30 caches, so yeah, I'm doing fairly well. 
I mean, I should say I take my um, online matches uh, in small stakes in a wee bit. It's not like uh, huge, but I still take these matches seriously as a preparation for live tournaments. So I put my earplugs, even when I'm playing from the comfort of my home, you know, I uh, try to, you know, take it seriously as if it's like the, you know, the, the most important match. So yeah, that also helps, you know. <laughs> But that's that's interesting. Do you do you like playing online or do you do you prefer playing live matches? I think I prefer playing live. Yeah, but uh, again, uh, online is definitely very convenient. You get to analyze your matches right away. I mean, super super important for sure. Yeah. But I guess I slightly prefer live for sure. <laughs> So the future, what does the future hold for you? Obviously, Monte Carlo, um, you're going to imminently, and I wish you uh, good luck. I think Thank you're you. going to be a, a worthy and very strong opponent, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit tough there, yeah. And I had a really, like, a crazy run last four tournaments, uh, you know, kept the caching, so I don't know if it, if it will continue, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> it has to stop at some point at Begavon, so... But yeah, let's let's hope there will be something good. Yeah, but it will be fun in any case. Yeah. What What else do you have uh, lined up? Anything else in the calendar? Yes, I will play Lions Cup in the late September, I think, uh, which is a tournament organized by Walker Sonnabend. He also organizes the uh, German Open, and uh, mm -hmm. which is an amazing, super strong, great tournament. And I've never been to Lions Cup, but I've heard great things about it. So I really hope that I will be able to make it this year. And did I play in any other tournaments? So I guess I will do Cyprus in yeah. November, probably. But yeah, not really haven't, haven't really planned much yet. So. Fantastic. Well, um, if you're going to any of those tournaments, they they will they will see you there. <laughs> say say hello to Miss Lab. Um, <laughs> um, Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ms. Lau, for coming on my channel um, yeah, and, and sharing your knowledge, being so honest and, and modest as well with you. Yeah, with thank you very much. I mean, I have to say I really don't like talking about myself too much uh, doing interviews, but when you invited me, I was super happy to accept because uh, I really enjoy your channel. I watched um, quite a few of your videos. I actually had to watch some of your latest ones because I was so busy playing, but uh, I think I watched about first 15 or 20 and I really enjoyed them with your lessons your the way you present the yeah that was really enjoyable and I would recommend it to to, to improving players yeah that, thank cool. you very much likewise I've enjoyed your content and I, I wish you all the best in your future tournaments. I hope thank to you see you. Yeah. Um, you I, I, in your videos and tournaments and everything. <laughs> thank you Miss Lav all, all yeah. the best to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take care. Thank you for coming right. on my channel. Sure, sure. Like and subscribe, folks, if you like my yeah. content. <laughs> All, All right. the best. See you later. Thank you.